Hello, I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. My guest today is Salm Noor Salehi, the CEO of T0, which specializes in the tokenization of private assets to make them both more liquid and more democratic. In other words, available to more investors. Sam, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dominic. Could you begin just by giving us a little of the history of the firm, the background of T0, how you came to where you are, are now? Sure. Uh, yeah, T0 was founded in 2014 by uh, our parent company, Overstock.com, which is an online e-commerce company that's publicly traded on NASDAQ. And uh, our founder at the time, uh, Patrick Byrne, had, uh, uh, was asked about Bitcoin on a couple of occasions during an interview. And at some point, we as a firm decided, and at the time, by the way, I was at overstock.com, uh, the, the company, uh, as an executive there. And we decided to integrate Bitcoin as a payment method to purchase products on overstock. And that just really sort of blew up in the media and got created a lot of buzz and energy. Um, so we started to take a more careful look at the technology behind Bitcoin, uh, the blockchain and smart contract technology, and uh, uh, started to see various applications of it, including for capital markets uh, and the, the stock markets. And that really that's how T0 was founded um, it was sort of just an incubated as a skunk work project for several years. And then two years ago, I joined T0 full time and, and uh, became the CEO of the firm. Uh, a little, about two and a half years, actually, now. So your, your origins lie in the, in the cryptocurrency area. When did you start to get excited about security tokens? Oh, it was pretty early on. We were one of the first. Um, I think uh, T0 was starting to work on it before there was even the concept of the security token. Um, so, so tokens and uh, uh, yeah, utility tokens, a lot of those came a little bit after. So we started around probably uh, T0 was formed in, formally in 2014. But your, your proposition always was to be a provider of technology infrastructure, not to be actually an issuer or investor in these instruments. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So where have you, where have you got to now in terms of the type of customers that you're attracting and looking to attract? And I divide those between investors and issuers. If you could make that distinction in your answer, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I thought you're thinking about it exactly right. So we have two sides to our network. We have an exchange at the middle that's regulated uh, by the SEC uh, and FINRA, and it trades assets. So we have one side, you have the supply side, which is the assets, the other, the demand customers trading those assets. And we're trying to grow both, which makes it quite challenging, but uh, also entertaining at the same time. Um, our customers from the asset or issuer perspective uh, have come from a wide range of backgrounds and sectors. Uh, so the biggest is probably real estate, uh, commercial real estate apartments. Uh, and so we're, we're tokenizing those assets. We recently added the St. Regis Aspen Resort, our ownership in that that's trading on the platform. So that's the largest asset class. Following that is probably funds, whether they're private equity or venture capital or uh, early stage funds um, that are looking uh, to tokenize and trade. And then lastly, it's growth companies or technology companies um, that are looking. So that's on the asset side. On the investor side, we have now six broker dealers integrated with our exchange technology, our ATS, and including our own, we just got regulatory approval to launch our own broker dealer. And that just went live uh, about a month, uh, actually less than a month ago. And do these broker dealers have any responsibility or any appetite for uh, supplying liquidity to the market or are they acting in a pure agency role? They're, well, they're really doing it in two capacities. One, just offering their investors the ability to trade the assets on our ATS. 
uh, and two, doing trades on behalf of uh, uh, their clients, so institutions. Um, so those are the two main purposes. They're, they're, they're not doing any type of market making yet. We are actually in conversations with a few market makers that we're hoping to uh, get live. And they're not even supplying temporary liquidity, like stepping in where a trade would otherwise get stuck. So it's a, it's a pure brokerage business they're running at the moment. That's right. Yeah, it's all just organic trading and it's growing very rapidly, actually. Month over month, we've been you know, almost doubling every month the last four months. Um, so the liquidity is, is still in its early stage, but it's growing nicely. Uh-huh. And what, what, what explains that? Is it the volume of issues or the volume of investors or, or both? Or is something else happening in time? I think it's a combination. You know, as we add assets like Aspen, for example, we saw increased interest. We did a dividend with our parent, Overstock.com. Uh, and that brought a new, uh, a lot of new investors to the platform. Um, and so it's, it's really adding additional securities of bringing interest and uh, adding a, integrating additional broker dealers is growing the liquidity. Just so I'm clear, you're, you're talking here of, of on the exchange, the security tokens, utility tokens. You're not talking about cryptocurrencies being traded on this exchange as well. Is that right? That's correct. And, and there's actually no utility. These are uh, strictly securities, uh, right. digital securities. And where, we're, where we are primarily focused is, as you mentioned, private assets, uh, where we think there's an op- the biggest opportunity, where there isn't uh, liquidity for the owners of the asset. Uh, and uh, there's all sorts of rules uh, for compliance that could all be streamlined using, you know, blockchain and smart contract technology. So you're not you're not invested in the cryptocurrency DeFi token space at all. We do have an app that trades crypto. It's a separate entity, a uh, subsidiary of uh, of T Zero, and with the goal of merging that with this uh, broker dealer or uh, regulated securities trading. So our plan is we and we've grown actually a substantial user base there. Uh, so we'd like to merge those two. So both our web experience on the broker and our apps, which trade crypto, uh, trade all digital assets, uh, including crypto and security tokens. So that's our longer term goal. Um, there's there's some regulatory work we need to do before we can combine those experiences, but that's that's our goal. Okay, but that's a, it's a good segue into understanding the, the, the technical side of, of your security token business. How do you, or how do your, your clients issue tokens? Are they working with their own advisors to structure these issues and then issuing them onto your platform? Or are you getting involved in that process as well? How does issuance work? Yeah, it, the, so there's two types of uh, ways we get assets onto our platform. One is they're doing a a capital raise. And so if a business is raising capital, uh, for example, a building is raising capital to be constructed um, or they're doing a a private placement round. uh, And so that's one way. And it really depends on the type of offering they do. There's, they can publicly register, they could do various uh, reg exemptions. The most common being reg D and reg S which allows companies to raise quite a bit of capital, but not publicly solicit uh, and market the offering. Um, And so so that's one way. And based on the rules around that offering is determines when they can trade and who can trade them. And all of that can be coded into these smart contracts. Uh, The second is, and the the approach we've shifted our, our focus to is direct listing uh, existing securities onto our platform. So rather than uh, going out and finding companies looking to raise capital, and, uh, and, and a lot of those have uh, you know, long lockup windows, for example, one year for Reg D before they're tradable uh, by all retail investors. They can be traded in a little sooner uh, by accredited investors. Um, but when you go the direct listing path, um, you can just tokenize an existing asset and have it trade right away on day one. Mm-hmm. 
And so that's a lot of our business development efforts are shifting to focus towards that. Okay. So on, on the one hand, it's like private placements, really the capital raisings. And on the other hand, you're looking to make existing assets more liquid. Correct. Exactly. And in terms of how these assets are traded, uh, these broker dealers that you referred to, they are um, driving the, the trading process and, and they're able to use their existing, I don't know, trade management platforms, are they? Or do you supply trading? Are people actually trading on the platform itself? Or are they Yeah, trading? it's actually a really simple process. One, they need to sign an agreement with our ATS, a subscriber agreement is what it's called, um, and which is a very short uh, contract. Then two, they need to integrate with our ATS, which we've uh, allowed multiple methods of doing that. One, they could white label our trading interface if they'd like, but more sophisticated broker dealers will want their customers to use their experience. And so they can integrate with that, which uh, in the financial world, typically they use what's called a fixed protocol to integrate. Mm -hmm. um, and so they can integrate that way and trade, trade the assets that are on our exchange. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people don't need to rebuild their trading technology in order to trade assets on this platform? No, they don't. Um, they just use that fixed protocol and all of the blockchain stuff, you know, wallet management and the custody, all that stuff happens behind the scenes. And, and so they don't need to worry about all that. We, we provide all that technology. Okay, well, we need to understand that too. You've mentioned fix. Um, are you now going to tell me you're using Swift in the in the post trade area as well? Are yeah. you? Other, yeah, you are. Uh, we're yeah, we're offering AP different API integrations as well. Uh, most of these broker dealers prefer that fix, and uh, you know, me coming from outside of the financial world is like, well, we need to offer various uh, API integrations, but those haven't been as popular so far. Okay. So how, how are the transactions actually settling? Are they settling on the platform as well or, or, or on the platform and off the platform? Uh, they, they happen on the platform. We, so today with US securities laws, we do have kind of traditional, uh, uh, like a transfer agent. We work with a company called Computer Share, which keeps track of the books and records uh, in addition to the blockchain. Um, uh, but we think it's a, you know, an iterative process, an incremental journey is, as we make regulators more comfortable and realize uh, more of the benefits of this technology. Uh, and when we talk about settlement on the platform and computer share keeping a list of, of who owns what, are we talking about settlement of, of digital tokens against payment tokens? Or, or are people coming off the platform to settle in US dollars? fiat currency? Uh, today, it's mostly uh, fiat di uh, dollars being traded. Um, uh, we do, we are looking into using other uh, uh, currencies to trade, for example, uh, even cryptocurrencies to buy securities. Okay. Uh, would a central bank digital currency be helpful to your, to your model if you get US dollars actually on the platform in digital form? Yeah, yeah, I was going to mention that we are in conversations with a couple of firms to use uh, their digital dollar. Uh, and that helps solve a lot of so we're trying to go to near instant settlement. And uh, our approach to solving that is to partner with a firm which we hope to do soon um, to uh, be able to trade a digital currency for uh, for securities in near real time. And if you, if you do manage to go to instantaneous settlements, what are the implications of that for the safekeeping, the custody of these, these assets? You mentioned wallets earlier. Can people bring their own wallet or do you supply them with a wallet or both? Um, they do. They can keep their own wallets and withdraw their securities or currency to a private wallet. But to trade today, they have to uh, deposit deposit those uh, assets with a firm that's whitelisted with our ATS. And so they can't just go off and trade it peer to peer today, um, you know, perhaps someday in the future, but today, um, so they can withdraw and hold it, but, they, but to trade, 
they have to come back to the uh, ATS to trade. And do you get a lot of questions from investors about uh, the safety of, of their assets? Is that a very high concern for the people coming to the platform as investors? Um, it, it has come up, but I wouldn't say it comes up too often. Because these are, you know, and maybe it's the nature of how we're approaching it, but with traditional broker dealers being the interface to trade these assets, but um, there aren't the same concerns of their, you know, like their Bitcoin being hacked and, and taken. Because you can replace the tokens if they get yeah. missing, right? That's correct. They're not bearer instruments like uh, Bitcoins. Uh -huh. And the, the, the safekeeping technology you're using is is there anything unusually interesting about that that listeners would like to hear about um i i don't know if there's anything particular we do have that traditional bookkeeping i said in addition to the blockchain i think very soon you'll have the blockchain be the primary source of truth and maybe kind of traditional transfer agents be kind of secondary to that um so so um, so those are the ways we're ensuring um, it. So we're, we have, if anything, more, uh, more information on who owns what. One, one final question for you. You, you mentioned earlier that the, the market is starting to grow pretty healthily uh, in, yeah. in recent months. If you look, I don't know, as far as three years ahead, how do you expect the, the security token markets to develop, particularly in relation to the conventional securities markets? Yeah, I think uh, it will have really, so I, the last year or two has been more regulatory approvals and build, building infrastructure. I think uh, you're seeing that shift now to, uh, to, you're really starting to see product market fit where it uh, the in, in niches where it makes sense. Not, I don't think of tackling public markets first is, is, is something uh, you'll see security tokens in in the near term. Um, but you will see traction in private assets. And we're already seeing traction in, in the size of the deals and the quality of the deals seems to be getting stronger and stronger, uh, uh, particularly more recently. Um, you'll, uh, so I think in a few years, you'll see, um, you'll see a liquid market, for example, for pr uh, private companies and a lot of these assets that traditionally investors didn't have access to, they can now invest in. Um, re and really, you might see other interesting alternate, alternative assets where that have found a niche here. Um, but really, this technology allows you to trade anything of value uh, or any asset can be tokenized, whether it's, uh, you know, a sports contract, a, a singer, or it's a, a sports team. Um, and so you'll see various niches that take off and get traction with these. Um, whether that starts to bleed into the public markets, um, maybe not in three years, but, uh, but various areas like private markets, I think will be real exchanges like you see with a New York Stock Exchange. So in a sense, tokenization is bringing the benefits of securitization to markets, which are not yet securitized, uh, illiquid assets, right. private assets. And as you right, know, and, uh, and there's a chart, uh, but you can see that most of the value creation of a company is now happens while it's private. And so these private equity firms really realize most of the growth and value that comes with these private companies. Uh, companies are staying private much longer. There's, it's on average, I think, 11 years now, or it used to be three or four years. And uh, so uh, democratizing access to that and allowing uh, investors to participate in that growth, I think, is, uh, is, is a really worthy cause and so I, I, that's what I think we'll see in, in two to three years. And the balance between retail and institutional, as we look ahead, will it become more and more institutional, this market? Yeah, definitely seeing more of a shift towards institutional. Um, I mean, with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but I think you'll see that in security tokens as well. 
Sam Noor Salahi, thank you very much. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much, Dominic. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.